thank you for this wonderful morning. Thank you for the great and mighty things that you have been doing. We exalt your name, Spirit of the living God. We lay our lives before you this morning. Lord, we are asking for great grace, wisdom, insight, restoration through your word, divine instruction. You enable us, Lord, to be at the center of your will. So that God, as we are here this morning, our lives will never be the same in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray for utterance into your presence, your word. We pray for access, O oh God, into your presence. We pray for divine revelation and insight, eye-opening to your word. Be thou glorified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to thank God for this wonderful morning and the privilege that we have in his presence. Hallelujah. And so by the special grace of God, we're going to go through God's word quickly because of time. Amen. And to, today we're going to be looking at the topic title, Living a Christ-Centered Life. Living a Christ-Centered Life. If you have your Bible, Let's look at 2 Corinthians. Let's start from there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We we're talking about living a Christ centered life. 2 Corinthians 4, we're there, verse 1 to verse 11. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden thing of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness, praise God. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse number 4. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds, of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, had shined in our hearts to give the light. To, the, to give the light of, no, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. The excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, praise God. Cast down but not abandoned. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also which Jesus, the life also of Jesus, excuse me, might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Praise God. Now, looking at this church and looking at what the apostle wrote to the church, this was a letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. They were going through a whole lot of persecutions, a lot of constraints. There were difficult moments. There were times of necessities and all of that. But these men of God were conscious about what God was doing and they were also concerned about the souls that they were leading, the people of God. Hallelujah. And so he got to the point, he was admonishing them as to how to live a Christ-centered life. Praise God. He let them know that there is a lot of misconception about the truth, but then they have received the mercy and as such, they received the mercy of grace, they received the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they've made up their mind not to faint. In other words, they're not going to give up. Praise God. And they're not going to handle the things of God deceitfully. They're not going to live contrary to the word of God. But they're going to serve God and serve man with a clear conscience. 
And he says, this gospel, even if the gospel is here, it is here to those who don't know the truth, those who are lost, praise God. But then he get on to say that they preach not themselves, praise God, but they preach Christ Jesus Christ. And that was the gospel. Because the focus and the, the, the intention of, of preaching the gospel was to make Jesus known. Jesus is the Savior, praise God. Jesus is the Redeemer. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. And so they wanted to reveal who Jesus truly is. And the only way that will happen is to preach Jesus, not themselves. Praise God. And he says, we have these treasures in hidden vessels, earthen vessels. And verse 8 says, we are troubled on every side. There were trouble on every side. They were being harassed, being persecuted. Then the Bible says, yet not distressed. In other words, they were continuously focused. They were overzealous. They were committed. They didn't allow their persecutors to derail them. They didn't allow their persecutors to sort of like manipulate them or, 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 or shift them off from the faith. Or to hinder their visions. But they kept their focus. They were steadfast. They were still committed. It says that they were being troubled on every side. Every side. I don't know which side or what side you've been troubled in your personal life. But look at these men of God that were troubled on every side. Can you imagine that? Financially, they were troubled. Personally, they were troubled. Spiritually, they were troubled. Emotionally, they were troubled. Relationally, they were troubled. Mentally, they were troubled. Physically, not to talk about that, they were beaten many times, imprisoned many times. Yet, the Bible says, even though they were troubled on every side, yet not what? Not distress. Praise God. These are men and women who have their focus centered on Christ. These are men of God who live a Christ-centered life. Praise God. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not what? In despair. We're not going to give up. Though we are troubled, but we're not going to give up. We're perplexed. We're not going to give up. We're not going to allow stress to overtake us. Verse 9. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroy. Persecuted, still not forsaken. Cast down, still not destroy. Verse number 10. Always bearing, look at this. Bearing about in the body of dying, in the body, sorry, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus Christ might be made manifest in our body. In other words, they were saying, we always continuously, right? anticipate, hoping and believing that the body of Christ will be part of our body, the life of Christ will be part of our body, the desire of Christ will be part of our body, the vision of Christ will be part of our body in the midst of what we are going through. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Christ Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. Now, let's begin to sell. In the physical, you may say, well, at a time like this, we need compensation. At a time like this, we need God to intervene and comfort us. We need comfort. We need uplifting. We need, we need encouragement. At a time like this, we need support. At a time like this, looking at their condition and their position, if you were in this position, you would have said, well, I need to retreat and withdraw myself and reconsider such experiences that I've been going through. Is this the will of God for me? Praise God. But yet this man never gave up. This man never allowed themselves to be deceived. This man never allowed their persecutors to get their way. The Bible says in the midst of that being, being perplexed, in the midst of them being, being um, 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 troubled on every side, yet peering about, the Bible says in verse 10, the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus. Praise God. That the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. They are pitying there for Jesus and they are asking again that the life of Jesus be made manifest in their body. At this particular time, they were not even praying for a miracle. They were not asking for deliverance. They were not asking God bless me, you know, bless me or bless us. They were not asking or say God, you know, provide. That was not even their intention. But look at it. In the midst of their persecution, in the midst of their disappointment, in the midst of their trials, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their affliction, in the midst of the scars on their body, their imprisonment, they've been beaten and battered. Hallelujah. Yet they said that the life of 
Jesus Christ might be made manifest in their body, in our body. What a goal, what an ambition, what a vision. In other words, these men were overtaken by the lifestyle of Christ. They were Christ-centered. Look at verse 11. He said the same thing again in verse 11, but in a different way. For we which live are always what? Delivered unto death. In other words, they are always at the point of death. Always been threatening that they are going to kill them, imprison them, torture them. So death was knocking at their door every time, always, and yet they didn't give up. Hallelujah. He says, we were being delivered unto death for Christ's sake. And yet they refused to abandon Christ. They refused to give up on the things of Christ. They still love Christ. They still want the body of Christ to be part of their body. They still want the vision of Christ, the will of Christ to be part of their will. In the midst of being persecuted for Christ. Look at it. He says, he says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Where are those Christians that will say, I have opened my mouth like Jephthah and I won't go back? Where are those Christians who are going to be so committed to the things of God that they never allow anything to sway them away or anything to get them to be discouraged? Where are those Christians that will, that will contend for the faith and say, if I live, I live for Christ. If I die, I die for Christ. Praise God. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Quickly, Philippians chapter 1. We're talking about living a Christ-centered life. Praise the name of the Lord. Philippians chapter 1. Thank you, Jesus. Are we ready for this? Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 1. Are we there? Verse number 21. What does it say? Let's take it from verse 20. According to my honest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. I will not be ashamed in nothing. Praise God. It says, but that with all what? Boldness, as always, so now also, take note of these words, so now also Christ shall be manifest, uh, magnified in my body. Christ shall be magnified in my, body, in my body, whether it be by life or by death. You see that? Let me go over that verse again. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Bible says that this man's desire was something else. Look at it. According to my honest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. So it doesn't matter what you will do to me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of God's word. I'm not ashamed of the truth. I'm not ashamed of my faith. Praise God. But it didn't stop there. He says, but that with all boldness, hallelujah, as always, as always, as always, I'll continue to be bold. I'll continue to do the same thing. I'll continue to be committed. I'll continue to be faithful. I'll continue to be holy. I'll continue to walk in righteousness. I'll continue to do the will of God. I'll continue to live a life for Christ. He says, as always, for now, even now also, Christ shall be what? Magnified in my body. Whether it be by life or by death. Where are those Christians that will be so Christ-centered to the extent that they will say, Christ must take glory in my body. He must take glory in my heart. He must take glory in my spirit. Must take glory in my finance. Must take glory in my marriage. Must take glory in my job. Must take glory in the church. My, must take glory in my ways. Christ must take glory in all of my character. Whether it be by life or by death, he must be magnified. He must take the glory. He must be praised. Look at 21 now. This is why I brought you here. 21 says, For to me to live is Christ. Do you see that there now? To me to live is what? Christ. And to die is gain. So in other words, without Christ, I rather die. And dying is a gain. But living is of Christ. How many of us will say to live is Christ, to die is gain? How many of us will be that committed, that faithful, that, that serious, that disciplined to say, it doesn't matter what the world will offer me, or it doesn't matter the pressure and, and the trials and the level of persecution I will go through for me to live is Christ. 
In other words, it doesn't matter where I may find myself or the condition, the nation, the nation or, or the experience that I will, I will be going through to live is Christ. Whether in the Middle East or in Asia, to live is Christ. Whether in Africa, in Europe or in America, to live is Christ. Praise God. Whether I have it or not, to live is Christ. Whether the world approves it or not, to live is Christ. Whether the government is against him or not to live is what? Is Christ. Praise God. To live, I will not live without him. Everything must be what? Christ-centered. Christ-centered. To live is Christ. So the honest truth is that there is no way you and I can live this life without Christ. According to St. John chapter 1. St. John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus Christ is God and he came into the world and the world could not recognize him. He came unto his own, his own received him not. And what they do not even understand is that, that even in his presence, look at it, St. John chapter 1 verse number 9. St. John chapter 1 verse 9. Let me don't just say it. Hallelujah. Over there, St. John chapter 1 verse number 9. Let's take it from verse 8. He says he was that he was not that like that is John the Baptist, but was sent to be a witness of that light. Verse number nine. Now he's talking about the light. He says that was the true light. He's talking about Jesus. That was the true light. What happened to this true light? That was the true light which lighteneth every man that cometh into the world. Praise God. You remember this light is life in this same chapter. The Bible says the light is life, praise God. And the light is Christ himself. Now he said the light is the true light that lighteneth all men that cometh into this world. So which means that every man that cometh into this world have the light of Christ, have the life of Christ. They have, we all have the light and the life of Christ. And that is why the scripture clearly says without him we can do nothing. Now take note, I'm taking you somewhere. Now, if this life of Christ or the light of Christ is in us, according to St. John chapter 1 verse 9, it means that according to God's word, each and every one of us ought to live a Christ-centered life. Praise God. Because he is the light that lighteneth all men that cometh into the world. Praise God. So the light of Christ is in you. The life of Christ is in you. Praise the name of the Lord. These are the reasons why in our Christian faith, the Bible says something interesting in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. The Bible says we must look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Praise God. Who is the author? Jesus. Who is the finisher? Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12. Are we there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's even take it from verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2 says something interesting. Looking unto Jesus. Why Jesus? Because Jesus is the light that lighteneth all men that come into the world. You remember now. We just read it from St. John chapter 1 verse 9. Praise God. Jesus himself came and said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible also says, he that had the Son had what? Had life. He that had not the Son had not life. Are you following? Are we getting it? So now you say now, looking unto Jesus as a child of God, if you are going to live a Christ-centered life, an effective Christ-centered life, a profitable life that will glorify God, a life that will be of righteousness and true holiness, a life that is of integrity, a life that is in line with the word of God, it must be Christ-centered. It must be Christ-centered. Looking unto Jesus, who is Jesus? He's the author. Don't forget that word. We're going to deal with those two words. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. You see that there? He's the beginner and he's going to be the one that will end everything about our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, who is Jesus? He's the author and the finisher of our faith. 
So as a child of God, the day we became born again, we gave our life to Jesus Christ, it clearly revealed to us that we have given ourselves up unto the author and the finisher of our faith. Praise God. Or in, in other words, the day we gave our life to Jesus Christ is a clear indication that Jesus Christ already begun a new work in us. Praise God. And the Bible says, he who had begun a new work in us will, at the end what? He will complete it. Praise God. So our focus must be Christ-centered. Christ-centered. So take note of these words. He says he is the, what, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now who is an author? I'm not talking about being an author like someone that, that, that writes a book. Praise God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an initiator. Praise God. I'm talking about the beginner. Praise God. I'm talking about the foundation. Praise God. So Jesus is the beginner of our faith. Jesus is the foundation of our faith. Hallelujah. Jesus is the author of our Christian faith. So if we're talking about Jesus being the author and the finisher of our faith, we should be thinking about Jesus being the foundation of our faith. Praise God. So if Jesus is the foundation of our faith, listen beloved, you will not be stranded. If Jesus is the foundation of our faith, you will not miss the back. If Jesus is the foundation of our faith, you will, not, you will not fail. You will not be disappointed. If Jesus is the foundation of our faith, listen to this, beloved. You will have enough grace to endure till the very end. Praise God. A lot of people do not pay attention to Jesus at all. They pay attention to their churches. Oh, I like my church. My church is a very small church. It's a community church. Oh, I like the relationships in the church. The way people interact and the fellowship. Oh, it's such a warm church. Oh, it's such a nice place to be. Yes, the church is a nice place to be. But what about the author of the church? Praise God. Oh, I thank God for my Christian life. Oh, Christian people are nice. I like the interaction. I like the way they care for each other. How about the father of your faith, who is Jesus himself? Now, there is a serious problem in the body of Christ today. And I really, really want to point this out. What we've seen is that most men of God have stolen the heart of the people away from God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Instead of the people looking onto Jesus, they're looking onto their pastors. Praise God. Instead of people looking onto Jesus, they're looking onto the church. Instead of people having a relationship personally with Jesus, there are many church members who have a relationship with the church and the church leadership, but they never have a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is dangerous. Jesus is supposed to be the all in all. And these are the reasons why, if you, if you watch me, most times, I'm not saying this out of pride, but by God's grace to the glory of God, 99% of the time of my I, I stand in front of you to preach. My messages are Christ-centered. I have nothing to tell you to impress you about myself because I'm not worthy enough. I have nothing to tell you about the church or the overseer or the bishop. No, none of us are worthy enough. None of us are qualified. None of us are, I mean, we, we, we cannot take the place of Christ. It's not possible. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let no man take the place of Christ in your life. Let no church take the place of Christ in your life. Let no doctrine take the place of Christ in your life. Let no level of faith take the place of Christ in your life. That personal, intimate relationship with God is the very most important thing that you need in your Christian life. Praise God. You, as a child of God, must know Jesus personally. You must know him relationally. You must know him experientially. And if your faith is Christ-centered, with or without your pastor, you can still survive. Praise God. If your Christian life is Christ-centered, with or without the church, you can still make it. When your Christian life is Christ-centered, Jesus is with you always. The Bible says, for Lord, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Your pastor will not be with you always. Your church might not be with you always. But thank God, Jesus will be with you when and where, always, how? Even unto the end of the age. So he is the author. He is the foundation. He is the beginner of our faith. 
So when we talk about being an author, we're talking about the foundation. And when we also talk about foundation, we are talking about the strength of a building. We're talking about the strength of a structure. We're talking about the strength of our life. We're talking about the strength of our family. We're talking about the strength of our visions. The foundation of everything that we're doing is supposed to be Christ-centered. So if Christ is the foundation of whatever you are doing, there is assurance that you're going to make it. If Christ is the foundation of whatever you are doing, there is hope that you will not fail. If Christ is the foundation of whatever you are doing, then he will be responsible because he is the what? The beginner of whatever you are doing. The reason why many Christians struggle, praise God, we're struggling is because many times we initiate things for ourselves. We do not allow Jesus Christ to initiate things for us. So you are going by the instruction of someone else. You are going by your own idea or logic. You are going by your feeling. You are going by the opinion of other people. And whatever you are doing was not initiated by Christ. But beloved, may I say this to you. Whatever it is that God initiated in your life or in any case where Jesus is the foundation, Jesus will also bear the responsibility. Praise God. So if Jesus is the foundation of your marriage, Jesus will bear the responsibility of your marriage. If Jesus is the foundation of your church, then Jesus will bear the responsibility of your churches. If Jesus is the foundation of your life, then Jesus will bear the responsibility of your life. But if Jesus is just a casual friend, and yet you are just doing whatever you are doing, listen, casual friend will not always be there all the time for you. Praise God. So let's look at this word foundation. Foundation. When we talk about foundation, as I said earlier, a foundation is the strength of a building or it is the strength of an, a structure. Praise God. And there are two kinds of foundations. There's what we call the shallow foundation, which is about one to three meters deep. Praise God. And there is this deep foundation. We have a shallow foundation. We have a deep foundation. The deep foundation is that which gets to the subsoil. It gets deeper and under, deep, 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 and under until you get to the solid soil, the subsoil that could handle the weight or the pressure from a building. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what is the foundation here? If Jesus is the foundation, let's look at the importance of the foundation. Take note, I'm going to go deeper. The importance of the foundation, number one, it is the beginning of every building. Is Christ the beginning of your life? The foundation is the beginning of every structure. It is the beginning of every building. It is the beginning of every vision. It is the beginning of every business. It is the beginning of every church. It is the beginning of every life. It is, that is why the Bible says in St. John 9, it is the light that lighteneth all men that cometh into the world. So without him you can do nothing. The foundation is important because it is the beginning of every structure or building. The foundation carries all the weights and the materials. Foundation usually carries all the weights and the materials. Praise God. Number three, number three, foundations hold everything together. A foundation is responsible to hold everything together. The foundation is what hold the pillars and the walls and all the frames, praise God, and all the, flower, uh, the floors, and, and what else? The windows and everything that is supposed to be part of the building. Everything is rested on the foundation. Praise God. So the foundation holds everything together. Praise God. What is it that is holding you together? What is it that is holding you together? Praise God. Who is carrying the weight of your life? Who is bearing the burden of your life? Who is navigating every aspect of your life? Who is in charge, in other words? The foundation holds everything together. The foundation also resists movement. It resists movement. Praise God. If you lay that foundation, the building ought not to be shaken. The building ought not to move. Why? Because if the foundation is solid, it resists movement. What is it? That is holding you from being moved. Praise God. Is it Jesus Christ? Many of us are easily moved. Moved by problems. Moved by trials. Moved by constraints. Moved by sickness. Moved by difficulties. Moved by necessities. And as a result, you keep moving here and there. That is why you keep shaking. And sometimes you're even falling. 
You are moving and shaking and falling. Why? Jesus is not the foundation. If truly Jesus is the foundation, you will not be moved. Praise God. That is why the psalmist says, my heart is fixed, my heart is fixed, and I will not be moved. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. You will be able to resist movement. You will not be easily tossed here and there. Hallelujah. The foundation makes the structure reliable, praise God, and it avoids defect. The foundation makes the structure reliable and avoid defect. Praise God. If Jesus is your foundation, trust me, he will make your life very reliable and you will avoid defect. If Jesus is the structure of your life, if he is the, I mean, if he is the foundation of your life, he will make the structure of your life to be very, very reliable and you are going to avoid defect. Praise God. The foundation protects from falling. Protect the building from falling. In fact, on the news, <laughs> when I was studying this, and then my mind just ran down to what happened in the U.S. You see, it's, it's, it's right there now on the news, right? All these days. The building that collapsed. You remember that? Where is that? Is that New Jersey or Florida? Florida. You see, people are under the rubble. People have already lost their life. Pray that God console them. Why? Because the problem they said the building collapsed, it must have started from the foundation. So the foundation makes the structure reliable and it avoids defect. The foundation protects the building from falling. Praise God. The foundation gives support. It strengthens and gives support. Praise God. The foundation, listen now, listen to this now. The foundation somehow is the lowest part of the structure. The foundation is also the hidden part of the structure. And the foundation is the strongest part of the structure. I must say that again. The foundation is the lowest part of the structure. It is the hidden part of the structure. But at the same time, it is the strongest part of the structure. Is Jesus your foundation? Praise God. Is Jesus your foundation? Beloved, if Jesus is your foundation, trust me, trust me, beloved, you are sure to make it in this life. These are the reasons why you ought to live a Christ-centered life. Praise God. The foundation also determines the size of the building. The foundation determines the shape of the building. The foundation determines the height of the building. The foundation determines the length or the width of the building. The foundation also determines the beauty of the building. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The foundation determines the integrity of the building. The foundation determines how reliable the building is. So the question is, what is your foundation? Who is your foundation? So if we're talking about living a Christ-centered life, and the Bible says that Jesus Christ is that foundation that has been laid. Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus is the only foundation and is the foundation that has been laid that will sustain our lives. Praise God. It is the foundation that determines the integrity of our life. It is what we should rely upon. Praise God. Jesus is that foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at that quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Thank you, Jesus. I hope I'm blessing you this morning. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 9 down to verse 18. Are we there? Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 9 down to verse number 18. For we are laborers together with God. Take note of these words, okay? Very important. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Praise God. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, a wise master builder. I say wise master builder. Now Paul is giving a narrative about how the church is, the structure of the church, right? But he's saying, according to what? The grace of God which is given unto me, praise God, he's talking as to how he does the building. That is the church. How we go about planting churches. How we go about building the body of Christ. Praise God. So he says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder. Don't forget that. Not any kind of a builder, but he's a wise master. Not just a builder, but in fact, he's a master builder. 
You see that there? He's a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. Is Paul the foundation? Did Paul say, I am the foundation? As mighty as he was, as, 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 listen, he wrote more than all other authors in the Bible. He wrote all the episodes. He had more revelation than nearly all of them. Highly educated. But the man never, he never attempted the glory of God. Praise God. He didn't take the glory for himself. Look at it. He said, even though he's a wise master builder, he says, I have laid the foundation. He didn't say, I am the foundation. In our world today, people are yearning for title. Overseer, founder, church founder, bishop, apostle, reverend. You know, so some people, if you don't put the title in front of their name, they might not call you. Or they might not, they might not sort of like recognize you because why? It's as if you are despising them or, or you do not recognize them. So in return, they won't recognize you. Before you call you, 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 must, you must make mention of doctor or archbishop or apostle or overseer, coordinator, right reverend. Nonsense. All of those titles are nonsense if you are not living the life and if you are not called. Look at the way he puts it. He says, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. He's going to tell us what the foundation is. And another builder thereon. This was the time when they were having problem in the church of Corinth. There was this division between them. And some of them were for Paul. Others were for Apollos and all of that. And Paul was like trying to rectify that this is not even necessary. Competition is not necessary in the church. Praise God. He says, another builder thereon. He says, but let every man take heed how he builded thereupon. Now, let me say this before I proceed. The problem why people could not, or many believers, even believers in the, in the Christian faith, they won't accept totally, they will not accept the lordship of Jesus Christ is because of the principles. Praise God. And so they are, they are very skeptical. They are scared. And look at the principle here. He says, he says, let every man, what? Take it how he build it there upon. What are you building upon Jesus Christ? How do we build upon Jesus Christ? And this is where many people run into trouble. Because why? They cannot accommodate Jesus because they know that whatever they are doing, they will not build that thing upon Jesus Christ. Are we getting it now? And so there are so many believers out there who ignore the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They ignore him as the solid foundation. Why? Because they know that whatever they are building upon, Jesus Christ will not accommodate that thing. Or whatever instrument that they want to use to build, they will not build that upon Jesus Christ. And as such, because they know that Jesus will not accommodate or tolerate whatever they might want to build upon him, they, they, they prefer to ignore Jesus instead. And we've seen that many times. Praise God. Hallelujah. He says, let every man take it how he built it thereupon. Praise God. And look at the interesting thing here. Verse 11. He says, for all the foundation. Now take note, very important. He's going to tell us about the foundation and who is the foundation. For all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Christ Jesus. I hope we get this. Now I'm not talking about your cultural foundation. I'm not talking about doctrinal foundation. I'm not talking about your concept about church, church structures, those foundations. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a Christ-centered life who is what? The foundation. Now, if you don't get it, look at what Paul says. He says, for other foundations can no man. Do you see that there? It's in your Bible. So it doesn't matter. Even if your foundation is, is doctrinal, your foundation is up. Uh, cultural, your foundation is traditional or your foundation, whatever the case might be, if it is not Christ centered, it's not going to go anywhere. So Christ ought to be at the center of it all. Praise God. He says, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. Sometimes we hear people ask this question. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Go back and study the word of God. That is why I'm not going to quote Psalm 11 here. Praise God. Because many men of God misunderstand that scripture. When you read the text, you read, you read the entire text, you understand the context. Praise God. Hallelujah. And when you understand the context, you discover that what the psalmist was talking about the foundation there was not your church doctrine. 
What he was talking about, the foundation there was not your tradition. It was not your culture. The foundation there is Christ himself. Praise God. That is why if you read the text, he was talking about how the enemy tried to pursue and the enemy is trying to say, you must flee. You must run away. And he said, how could I run away? It's not possible. I'm not going anywhere. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? In other words, then he go back and begin to talk about God being the protector. God is the savior. God is his Lord. God is the way maker. God is the deliverer. God is the rescuer. He's the redeemer. So he was saying, God is my foundation. I go nowhere. But if we don't understand, people can take that verse out of the text. Then, then the, 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 it becomes what? Is it the pretext? And then they use it for something else has, that has to do with maybe deliverance or maybe healing or maybe a uh, uh, culture. No, no, no. The foundation is Jesus. And that is what we've just read here. He says, for other foundation can no man. I don't care if you're a bishop, you're a pastor, you're an overseer, you're an apostle, you're a zonal leader, you're a coordinator. The Bible says, no man, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. This is not your job. Can we say that to each other? This is not your job. You are not qualified for this. He says, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. In fact, it is already done. You see that there? Then that is laid. And he clearly make it known. Who is this foundation? He said, which is Jesus Christ. We see that now? So when we're talking about the foundation there, Make sure we point to Jesus. Many people, as soon as they talk about foundation, they go to doctrine. As soon as they talk about foundation, they go, it's like what people normally do. As soon as they talk about holiness, the first thing they look at is Christian dressing. And what they don't understand is that Christian dressing is completely different from holiness because Christian dressing comes from church doctrine. Praise God. But holiness comes from God. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am what? Holy. So the moment we talk about holiness, the very first thing you should look at, not your pastor, not the sisters in the church, to begin to criticize or point fingers at them, not the brothers. The very first thing we should look at is God. Because holiness has nothing to do with things. It has to do with God. Be ye holy for I, God, Jehovah, I am holy. So look at me and be like me. Don't be like things. I hope I'm making sense to you this morning. So now when we look at the scripture here, it says, it says, there is no other foundation that any man will lay that that has been laid, which is of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, it says, it says, it says, now if any man build upon this foundation, now you see, these are the reasons why people don't build on Jesus. People don't pay attention to Jesus. Doctrinally, people don't even, they don't even try to emphasize on Jesus. Why? Because there's going to be a problem. He says, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, take note of this, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, praise God, because it shall be what? Revealed by fire. So God is not going to stop you, don't build, but you build. But whatever you build, at the end it's going to go through what? Fire. It's going to go through fire, revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You see that there? Praise God. If any man's work abide, which he had built, thereupon he shall receive a reward. You see that? 15. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. You see that there? But he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. For the Bible says, Know ye not, that ye are the temple of God, and that your spirit, look at this now, and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. The spirit of God dwelleth in you, praise God. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is what? You see it now? Holy. Why? The temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? The Bible says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So the, the, the focus ought to be, ought to be Jesus and Jesus alone. It's Jesus plus nothing. Praise God. Jesus plus what? Isaiah 28. Let me show you something again. Isaiah 28, 16. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. 
Shabrati Bosha. Limbrati Kabus Katarabalabadi. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 28. Verse 16. Are we ready? Let's, let's read together. What does it say? It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. God is speaking. Praise God. See, that is behold, I lay in Zion. You see that there? What is God going to lay in Zion? Huh, for a foundation, what? A stone, yes. A tried stone. Are you the stone? Is your church the stone? Is your doctor in that stone? The people out there, the stone? No, it didn't say in fact stones. It didn't say foundations. It said, I lay what? A Zion, a sure foundation, a stone, a tried stone. Uh, what? Precious corner stone. Singular. Praise God. It's the same. A sure, not foundations. Foundation, praise God. He that believeth shall not what? Shall not make haste. So who is that foundation? Who is that foundation? One more time. Who is that foundation? First Peter chapter 2 verse 6. First Peter chapter 2 verse 6. Let your relationship with God be Christ-centered. First Peter chapter 2. Are we there? Thank you, Jesus. Verse number six. Amen. Take it from verse five. Ye, all, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by who? Jesus Christ. Verse six. Wherefore also it is contained in scripture, in the scripture, Behold, I lay in what? In Zion, a what? A chief cornerstone, yes. Elect precious, yes. And he that believeth on him, that is the stone now. It's referred to him as a person now. He that believeth on him. You see that there? Huh. You see how the language changed? He's telling you now that this stone. Is a person. He that believeth on him shall not be what? Confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is the what? Is the head of the corner. Praise God. Hallelujah. This stone is becoming him now. Act chapter 4, verse 11. Act chapter 4, verse 11. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Act chapter 4. Are we there? Act chapter 4, verse 11. What does it say? He says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Praise God. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they had been with who? With Jesus. So Peter and others were preaching about Jesus, that Jesus is the, the stone, the head of the stone, the chief cornerstone, that the Jews they themselves they rejected, and he has become the head of the, 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 the corner. And the Bible says they're like, wow, these people are uneducated. How did they get this? How did they get to know this? It was spoken in Isaiah because they know the scribes and the Pharisees, they know the truth. How did they get this revelation? How, in fact, they get to understand this because they are unlearned men. Praise God. Beloved, let me say this to you. Jesus 
is the chief cornerstone. In fact, the Bible refers to him not just the chief cornerstone or the foundation, he's also called the rock. In the, in the Old Testament, through and through, God is known as the rock, the rock of ages. There are several scriptures that has to do with God being our rock. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God expects us to be Christ-centered. Why? If we do not have the foundation, which is Christ, the Bible says, who is the author, then we have a problem. Praise God. If we do not have the foundation, which is Christ, who is the author, then that building, building is going to collapse. If we do not have Christ, who is the foundation, who is the author, then we're going to be prone to destruction and to damage. Praise the name of the Lord. Let me give you a scripture. Look at the book of Luke chapter 14. You will not be able to survive the storm. You will not be able to accomplish your task without the foundation. And the foundation is Jesus. Let me give you a different insight of a scripture that you may have known. Luke chapter 14, 25 to 35. Luke 14. Are we there? 25 to 35. And there went great multitude with him. And he turned, that is Jesus is going to speak now, and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his, wow, hate not his what? His father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. He says, yea, and his own life also, even your own self, you must hate, he cannot be my disciple, right? And whosoever doth not bear or hear his cross, praise God, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my word, my disciple. Wow, that is complete surrenderedness is what Jesus is requiring from these people and from us also. 28. For which of you intended, this is, this is the point now, he's speaking a parable. Which of you intended to be a tower seated not down first? So the first thing you have to do is to what? Sit down. Sit down. Turn to your neighbor, say learn to sit. Count the cost. Consider. Praise God. He says, seated not down first and counted the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it. Don't forget, Jesus is speaking. But you might not understand this. You might look at it from another point of view. But I want to point your attention to Jesus himself. He's speaking, you are going to build a house. Sit down, count the cost. And query yourself if you have sufficient but what Jesus was saying directly to, in the, to them, directly or in there, he was saying, you are never going to have sufficient without me. He's, gonna, he's, he's, he's telling them that your sufficiency is in me. In other words, he said, I am, I am your source, I am your resource, and I'm your foundation. And look at the way he puts it, verse 29. He says, less happily, after he had laid the foundation, take note now, who laid the foundation? You. After the person that came to build the house, doesn't count the cost, he laid the foundation. Praise God. So this is another foundation. This is not Christ. Because the Bible says, who is the foundation? Christ is the foundation. So Jesus is saying, look at this now, pay attention very deep. If you lay a foundation that is not me, because I am the source, I am the resource, and I am the foundation, but if I am not part of your life as a foundation, you have a problem. And I'll reveal that to you. He says, happily after he had laid the foundation, praise God, Hallelujah. He says, and he's not able to finish it. You see, that's the problem. Every time you lay another foundation, you will not finish. Did you get it now? You remember Paul said there, there's no other foundation that a man will lay than that, that, that which has already been what? Been laid. So that is why, listen to this now, Christ must be the center of your life. It's the anchor. It's like the heartbeat of every part of your body. So you went ahead and laid the foundation and you don't have what it takes. You don't have sufficient because no man upon the face of this earth has sufficient. Our sufficiency is in what? It's in Christ. And then it's not able to finish. Obviously you won't finish because you don't have the source. You, I mean you are not the source and you don't have the resources. Praise God. It says all that behold it begin to mock him. These are the reasons why many people face mockery in life. Why? Because they are doing things without the help of almighty God. Without the help of Jesus himself, who is the foundation. 30. They will be mocking him saying what? This man began to peel and was not able to finish. It is obvious. If you are building without Christ, you are never going to be able to finish. 
Praise God. See verse 31. Hmm. Oh, what king? It says, oh, what king? Going to make war against another king. Seated not down first and counted and, and consulted and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with what? 20,000. Praise God. Or else, why the other is yet a great way off, he what? He sendeth an ambassage and desired what? Conditions of peace. Who is the prince of peace? You see? You are going to battle. And you, you abandon the prince of peace. You are not going with him. You have a problem. You are going to build and you forget the foundation. You abandon the foundation. You build your own foundation. You are not going to finish. Are you getting it now? So look at verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, of you, that forsaketh not all that he had, he cannot be my disciples. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost his savor, praise God, wherewith shall it be salted? You just throw it away. Useless. It doesn't worth anything anymore. Praise God. 35. It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Praise God. So you see, if Jesus is not your foundation, you won't finish. If Jesus is not your is not uh, part of your life as the prince of peace, you will not be able to accomplish your task. Let's look at another example about this same foundation we're dealing with before we go to the second point. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 6. Back up to Luke chapter 6. 47 to 49. Luke chapter 6. Hallelujah. Are we there? 47 to 49. It says, Whosoever cometh to me and hear it, take note. This is interesting. Hmm. This is interesting. He's going to tell you the secret now, the answer. Praise God. He says, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my saying and doeth them. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the what? The foundation. So if you come to the foundation, yes, praise God, and he's going to reveal that to you soon. And then you hear the saying of the foundation and doeth the saying of the foundation. He says, I will show you to whom he is like. Praise God. Now look at who this kind of person is. Hallelujah. He is like a man which built a house. He built a house and dig what? Deep. You remember I told you about two kinds of foundation. The shallow foundation, 1.3 meters, right? And I also told you about what? The other foundation where you go to the what? The, the deeper soil. Praise God. Hallelujah. So he says, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep. Praise God. And laid what? The foundation on a rock. Who is the rock? Jesus is the rock. Praise God. And take note. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen? When the flood arose, praise God, the stream beat out vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. Why? Why? It was founded on the rock. Who is the rock of ages? Jesus himself. It's the rock. It's the chief cornerstone. Is the solid foundation. So if you are building upon Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Look at it. Look at it. The Bible says the stream is going to beat against you. Praise God. The flood is going to rise against you. Amen. But they will not be able to shake you. So if Jesus is the center of your life and you are living a Christ-centered life, you'll be unshakable. Praise God. You'll be unmovable. You will not collapse. Even though the flood will arise against you or they might rose up to try to shatter your dreams your visions your intentions in life they won't succeed they might beat vehemently against you but you will be undefeated unshakable praise god verse 49 but he that hear it and do it not is like a man without a what a foundation without me it's like a man without me built a house upon the earth you are building without Christ. Praise God. You are, you, are, you are planning without Christ. You are running without Christ. You are doing things without the foundation. He said it's like a man without a, what? a foundation. Without Christ who is the foundation. Built a house upon the earth against which 
the stream dip it vehemently and what's going to happen? Immediately the Bible says it fell. These are the reasons why we see some immediate trouble. Some immediate catastrophes. Some immediate destruction. Damages. Praise God. And you begin to wonder how did this happen? Christ was not there. He was not the foundation. Praise God. Hallelujah. It says and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. If a church is not Christ-centered, the church is not built upon Christ, one day it will collapse. If the marriage is not built upon Christ, one day it will collapse. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, when you build upon Christ, let's see what's going to be the outcome. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. See the outcome when you build upon Christ. Hallelujah. If you build upon Christ, let's see the outcome. Ephesians chapter 2. Hallelujah. 19 to 22. Are we there? It says, Now therefore ye are no more what? Strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, praise God, with the saints and of the household of God. Take note, take note of these words now we're going. 20. It says, And are built upon the foundation of what? Of the apostles and prophets. What is this foundation of the apostles of the prophet? It says what? Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief corner what? Cornerstone. You see that there? So in this regard, what's going to happen now? In verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together goeth. So when you build upon Christ, you will be together. Your building will be fit together. There will be safety. There will be growth. There will be excellence. There will be provision. There will be peace. There will be development. There will be wholeness. Praise God. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple. There will be holiness. Holiness in the Lord. Righteousness in the Lord. Purity of life. Sanctity. Verse 22. In whom ye also are built together. You see that? There will be unity. There will be love. There will be oneness. For an what? An habitation of God through the Spirit. So, when we allow Christ to be our foundation, we will become the temple of God. We will become the building of God. We will become an habitation of the Spirit of God. The presence. Listen. The Spirit of God will not be in you and you collapse. The Spirit of God will not be in your marriage and that marriage fail. The Spirit of God will not be in your church and that church fail. It's not going to be possible. Why? Because the reputation of the Lord is on the line. Are you getting it now? If you build on the foundation of Jesus Christ and that building collapse, God has a shame to deal with. You get me now? Take for instance now, the building that collapsed in, in America there, they're investigating, they're checking, engineers are going this and all kinds of investigation have been done. Why? They want to know why this happened. Praise God. So can you imagine if that happened to you or to the church? Something goes wrong. The whole world wants to know, God, where were you? Why this happened? God, what happened to the Holy Ghost? What happened to the blood of Jesus? What happened to the name of the Lord? What happened to the anointing? What happened to all the prayers we've been praying? But listen, beloved, whenever things like that goes wrong, you realize that that individual have not been building on the foundation, which is Christ. These are the reasons why. Don't let your pastor be your foundation. Let the word of God be your foundation. Don't let your church be your foundation. Church can close today, but you can still continue with the Lord. Your pastor can move on today. You can still continue. Look at one pastor that died. The church is going. The church has to go. I was watching one of our leaders, our pastor back home. He died recently in Sierra Leone. I was watching the memorial on my way. But the church still has to go on. Why? Because he is not the foundation. The foundation is who? Christ. Praise God. So, let your life be Christ-centered. So, let's go to the second point and then we close. Praise God. He is the author and the finisher, according to the word of God. He is the finisher of our faith. He's the one that will fulfill us. He will bring us to fulfillment. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Look at this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. What does this say? Philippians 1. Are we there? Verse 6. Hallelujah. It says, be confident of this very. Do you see the language used there? What is the language? Very thing. You see the description? The description there. It is a very thing. 
Be confident in this very thing. What is that thing? That he which had begun a good work in you will do what? Will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you see the assurance? That is why Jesus ought to be your foundation. Because if he is your finisher, he will finish what he begun in you. He which shall be gone, be confident. I am confident. I am settled. I am assured. I know no matter how, how the storm will beat vehemently, how the flood will come to crush me, it will slam on me, but I won't go down. I will not die. I shall live to declare the glory of my God in the land of the living. No matter the trials, the pain, the affliction, the confusion, the sickness, the necessities in life, that is not going to seek me. Why? Because I am not the one who actually began it. He who began a good work is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he had promised and he will never fail. He who had begun a good work. So my confidence is in who? In him who had begun a good work. My confidence is in the church. You don't know. Let, let, let church hit you. You look at church people where you, you get angry. <laughs> I want to see people say, I will never go to that church again. I will never. Because something happened in that church that causes them to collapse. And you know why they collapsed? Because their hearts, their, everything was on the church, not on Christ. Let's go back to it. Big confidence of this very thing. That he, you see that there? Who is that he? Not your pastor. The church? No. Your money? No. Your education? No. Or your status? No. Your family, no. He that is Jehovah Almighty God who has begun a good work in me. Hi, Lord. I know, you know, you know what comes to my mind right now? It, it just reminds me when Moses turned to God, when God wanted to kill Israel out of anger. He said, hey, God, God, you, do you want these enemies to laugh at us? That at the end they will say because there were no graves here. That is why. Huh? You didn't kill them in Egypt. You brought them this far to kill. He said, he said God, don't let them. And God, the Bible says, God repented of his decision. Can you imagine? Moses cautioned God. God wanted to judge Israel because of their sin, because of their complaining, their mobbing. And Moses reminded God. He said, if you do this, the enemies will laugh. This is what came to my mind just now. That God will have begun a good work in you. If he stops now, what's going to happen? The enemy will what? Will laugh. That is never going to be possible. To fear God. Hi! God will never give a reason for the enemy to laugh. God will never give a reason for the kingdom of darkness to come and point their fingers against you. God will never give a reason for the enemy or the forces of darkness or the unbelievers to shame you. It's not going to be possible. Because his integrity is on the line. His name is on the line. His reputation, his death, everything, his glory is on the line. So if he started it, ah, yeah, yeah. You see, you, you listen, ah, mamroko shikete, yeah. These are the reasons why your focus should be Christ-centered. Let it be that it was Christ who started it. It was Christ who led you. It was Christ who gave it to you. It was Christ who spoke to you. It was Christ who ministered. It was Christ who instructed you. And so listen, you can hang your life on it. And say, Jesus, you told me. You told me. <laughs> Jesus on his throne said, yes, I did. And I will preserve the integrity of my word. You remember we learned about what happened with, the, uh, uh, with, with Paul in the book of Acts 27. He said, I believe God as it was told me. There shall be no loss. These ones were breaking their head there. These ones were confused. The others were crying. Paul was said, there shall be no loss. I believe God as it was told me. So in other words, I am not moved. They said they are shooting arrows. Arrows, it won't touch me. They said they are, they, are, they are scattering things. Let them scatter everything. They will scatter my own. They say our people are dying. Let them die. I won't die because I believe that God has told me I shall not die. He says even though the enemy shall come in like a flood, he will raise up his standard against them. Praise God. Hallelujah. He said a thousand shall fall on my left hand side. Ten thousand. You, know, you go back to God. Oh Lord, this is what you said and I read it. Are this not your word, God? Are this not your word? Don't you promise me that you said you will never leave me nor forsake me? Why well, my foundation is what? Christ-centered. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 to 11. Please, afterwards, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures. You're going to just write because of time. I'm not going to read them. But I will tell you exactly you just write them. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are we there? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Chapter 4. Let's go back to verse 10 and 11. We read it just now, but let's take a look at it. It says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Ah, my goodness. I imagine the life of Christ in me. <laughs> you remember Sunday? Was it Sunday or Wednesday? They said, because I live, you shall live also. So I'm not afraid. I am not afraid. I shall not die because Jesus said, because I live, I shall live also. Or because he lives, I shall live also. You see, these are the reasons why at a time like this we should be singing a song like this. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he owns my future. My life is worth living just because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he owns my future and life is worth a living just because he lives. One more time. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he owns my future, and life is worth a living just because he. Yes, keep that going. Keep that going. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he owns my future and life is worth a living just because he lives. Verse 11, it says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Inasmuch as we are delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, it says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Hallelujah. In other words, they are saying, Jesus is our focus. Jesus is is our hope Jesus is our life Jesus is our light Jesus is everything and everything is Jesus to live is Christ to die is gain praise God beloved if Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith it shall be well with you it shall be well with you these are the reasons why, beloved. The Bible clearly teaches us that it is through Jesus, only through Jesus, that we are who we are, or we will become what God wants us to become. Praise God. The victory that you are believing God for is in Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ. Praise God. The access that you need for God or His presence is 
through Jesus Christ who is the finisher. No wonder Paul could say in Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Through Christ. He knows what he was saying because he knows that he's the finisher. In Romans chapter 5 verse 9, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9, be fast. We are saved through Jesus Christ because he's the finisher. The Bible says we are alive in God according to Romans chapter 8, uh, chapter 6 verse 11. Why? Because Jesus is the finisher. He finished it all on the cross. The Bible says we have life through Jesus Christ according to Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. The Bible says we are privileged to reign in grace and through the grace of God because of Jesus Christ. According to Romans chapter 5 verse 12 he's the author and the finisher. The Bible says we are victorious through Jesus Christ. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Through Jesus Christ, we are victorious. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. The Bible says we are sufficient. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 4 to verse 5. Our sufficiency is of Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. The Bible says we obtain riches from the Lord according to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. The Bible says we are redeemed and we have the redemption through Christ according to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Praise God. The Bible says we are going to enjoy the goodness and the kindness of our God. According to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7. Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. Praise God. The Bible says we are made perfect. Perfection is our possession. We are made perfect. According to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 21. Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Praise God. The Bible says we are justified. We are justified according to Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Why? We are justified by faith through the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. The Bible says we are forgiven according to Romans chapter 5 verse 11. And we are forgiven. Why? Because Jesus came and he died on the cross and at the end he says it is finished it is the author and the finisher praise god the bible says we live through his grace and by his grace according to romans chapter 5 verse 15. why because jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith no wonder at the cross where he died the very last word he said father he says into thy hand I commit my spirit but then afterwards he could not commit that spirit into the hand of the father until he said it is finished may I say this to you that that which God had begun in you which is a good work he himself will glorify himself to accomplish that work in your life take God at his word stop following men stop worshiping people stop giving the glory to men Stop giving the glory to doctrine and churches. Stop giving the glory to tradition and people and pastors and friends. Give glory to God. Appreciate men. Honor men. Love men. Respect men. But let God be God. And let God take his place in your life. Live a God-centered life. You will walk in his righteousness. You will walk in his holiness. You will walk in obedience. You will be faithful. You will be pure. And you will be true. And at the end of which, at the end of which, you will be among the number that Jesus will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And turn to my rest. Beloved, are you ready to pray this morning? It may be that you are tired. It may be that you are exhausted spiritually. It may be that you are confused. It may be that you've lost sense of direction. All of these are happening because, you know what? You were looking at the wrong people, looking at the wrong thing, and looking at the wrong word. Praise God. I remember at one time someone was leading me somewhere. I was, I was somewhere in, 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 in the U.S. And I lost my way. And someone told me, he said, follow me. He said, when I get to the location where you're supposed to turn right, he said, I will honk. 
and I waved my hand. He said, you follow that road and you go straight. I said, okay. And while I was following this guy on the highway, other cars were coming in. Woo, wow, woo, wow. I was keeping my focus. I am following this guy, not you. This one will come, woo, I said, not you, this guy. This other one will come, woo, not you, this guy. I kept following that guy, following that guy, following that guy, following that guy. Until finally, about 15 minutes down the road, he kept honking, beep, 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 and he was waving, and he was saying, go down on the right hand side. Praise God. And when I used that road, I ended up at the destination that I was looking for. I didn't miss my way. Why? The Bible says that we must follow the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ as according to 1 Peter 2.21. Who are you, are you following? Who is your foundation? What is your focus in life? What is the center of your life? What kind of life are you living? Is it a God-centered life? Shall we pray this morning? Shall we call upon the Lord? Shall we lift up our voices unto the Lord? Because He lives, I can face tomorrow because leave all fear is gone because I know he owns my future and life is worth a living just Jesus is about to help someone this morning. Jesus want to heal, want to deliver, want to restore, want to save someone this morning. If you are that brother, if you are that sister, you haven't given your life to the Lord. 
today is your day. You can say to the Lord, Lord, I am sorry for all my sins. We're going to sing the song again. But then if you have never given your life to Jesus, I want you to tap your chest, your breast and say, Lord, because you leave, I can face tomorrow. I'm not going to commit suicide. I am not going to give up on my marriage. I'm not going to give up on my children. I'm not going to give up on that job. I'm not going to give up on my consecration. I'm not going to give up on my relationship with you. I am not going to give up on the church. I'm not going to backslide. Lord, I'm going to come back to you. Lord, I'm running back to your helping hand. Yes, Lord. Because in me, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds my future. In life is worth a living just because of me. Because he did. I can face tomorrow. Because he did. Or fear he's gone. I know oh, oh, He owns my future <laughs> life is worth And living just because of him One more time Because he lives Oh, I can face under the sound of my voice if you are not yet born again if you have not yet accepted the Lord you can do that right now say this with me say there Lord Jesus I come before you Lord I am sorry for all my sins have mercy upon me there Lord Jesus pardon me forgive me Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. You were in the grave. On the third day, you rose from the dead. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I believe in my heart and I confess it with my mouth that you are my Lord. Holy Spirit, seal me with your Holy Ghost. Seal my spirit I covenant my soul, I covenant my body with you, Lord. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Beloved, if you pray that prayer, the Lord loves you this morning, and you are safe. You are saved. Also, the Bible says there are angels in heaven celebrating your salvation. For those of you who are saved already, but yet you've been in and out of the pond, you've not been steadfast, and you've been missing the mark through the life of sin, I want us to pray together. Say, there, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for the sin of idolatry. I am sorry for looking at people instead of looking unto you. I am sorry, Lord, for allowing things to be my foundation, for allowing my own self to be my own foundation for allowing people and church and leaders and issues to be my foundation. Lord, I am wrong. You are my foundation. Jesus, you are my foundation. Holy Ghost, you are my foundation. Help me, Lord, that I will continue to keep my confidence, my trust in you and you alone. Thank you, Father. 
in Jesus mighty name hallelujah raise up your hands everywhere everyone let me pray with you quickly and I'll let you go our father we thank you for today thank you for the lives of your people thank you for every man and every woman under the sound of my voice Lord you said through Paul according to your word that this foundation which is you God that have been laid there is no other foundation that will be laid and Lord the psalmist according to Psalm chapter 11 says if the foundation be destroyed what shall the righteous do he was talking about you almighty God that you the foundation if you are destroyed the righteous will be hopeless in other words he was saying thank God God cannot be destroyed he was saying thank God he's all powerful thank God he's all great thank God he's all mysterious he's all miraculous and so this morning we are saying thank you Lord because you are our foundation that foundation that is undestroyable that foundation that is unstoppable that foundation that is all powerful strengthen us cause us oh God Lord to be planted in you and father it doesn't matter what the level of the wind the storm the flood may come to beat against our life vehemently we shall not collapse but we shall stand up we shall triumph we shall conquer we shall overcome in the name of jesus christ we rebuke every level of idolatry in our life we rebuke every self idolatry in our lives we rebuke every level of culture, tradition, and custom that we've adapted instead of depending on you, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you open our eyes to be all the one because things out of your word. That, Father, it is you plus nothing. It is you and you alone. Jesus, we pray that in every area and aspect of our life, we will be Christ-centered. That is why your word says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not unto our own understanding. But that God in all our ways, we should acknowledge you, that you will direct our path. Lord, you are our firm foundation. Direct the affairs of our lives to God. Those who are sick right now, strengthen them, O Lord. Heal them in the name of Jesus every sickness in your body receive the healing touch of our god receive the power of the lord receive 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 be deliver receive be deliver receive be deliver receive be here in the name of jesus christ i break every evil yoke of the enemy i break every yoke of affliction yoke of sickness and disease yoke of fear whatever operation or manipulation of the wicked one be destroyed in the name of jesus father we release your glory we release your grace we release your presence our eyes are on you oh god thank you lord yes lord we worship you lift up your hands and begin to bless the name of the lord Yes.
bless you beloved god richly bless you we want to thank god for your life thank you thank you out there for joining us we thank god for your time your patience and god will surely see you through in every area and aspect of your lives in the name of the lord jesus christ hallelujah you're always a blessing praise god hallelujah please don't forget to keep us in your prayers as we do the same for you and also share our messages to your loved ones your family members and your friends and uh, so that they will get to know the Lord and they will be saved. Praise God. I also want you to feel free to join us on Wednesdays for our Bible studies at 7 p.m. Hallelujah. And on Fridays also for our prayer session at 7 p.m. Canada time. Praise God. Toronto, Canada time. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Lord will surely see you through. Hallelujah. God bless you. And I hope you have yourself a wonderful and excellent weekend. Amen. And amen, and amen, praise God, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.